Shalom. Holy Scriptures and Israel is a ministry designed to share with the Jewish people the good news of the Lord Jesus Yeshua the Messiah and to instruct Christians on the Jewish roots of their faith. And now, teaching God's Word from a Hebrew Messianic perspective, here is Gideon Levitam. Hello, my dear friends. Our study is in the book of Revelation in chapter 2 and chapter 3. We are studying the seven letters that Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, the glorified Messiah, wrote to the seven local churches, local assemblies, local congregation in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. In this session, I would like to read to you the third letter that Yeshua, Jesus, asked Yohanan, John, to write to this assembly called the Assembly of uh, Pergamos. Let me read to you these verses that are found in Revelation uh, chapter 2, specifically from uh, verses 12 to 17. And I'm reading. It says... And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says, He which has the sharp sword with two edges, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Bilam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrifice unto idols, and to commit fornication. Thou so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name, written which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And so, beloved friends, we are studying here the letters that Yeshua wrote to these seven local congregations that are found in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey today. And as the Lord Jesus was asking Yohanan, John, who was on the island of Patmos, to write these Uh, letters, you could see that every letter that John had to write on behalf of the glorified Messiah was given in such a way that the Lord directly dealt with the condition in the local church, the local assembly in that city to which he wrote. Well, we already spoke about Ephesus. We spoke about Smyrna, and we have already learned that Ephesus had a healthy condition because they have held fast to the things of the Lord, but they have left the first love. On the other hand, Smyrna had had experienced suffering and persecution, and therefore the Lord Jesus the Messiah commanded them. He didn't have anything negative to say against the assembly in Smyrna. And we have already learned that these two 
churches represent already the two ages in in the church age the first hundred years the uh, 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 the Ephesian condition represented the first hundred years in church history and we'll also have learned that Smyrna represented the years from about 100 AD to about 313 AD and that represented the age of the persecution of the people of God, of the assembly of the living God. So now we have arrived to a third church that is found here in a town that is called, or in a city that is called Pergamos. In Hebrew, we read in the first verse, Ve'el malach kehal Pergamos ktov. And unto the angel of the uh, church, the congregation in Pergamos, right the word malach in the hebrew in the english it is really uh, the word there uh, is simply um, uh, angelos or angelos angel simply means a messenger in fact the lord jesus is writing to the spiritual leader or the spiritual leaders there is a plurality of leaders in a, any local assembly biblically speaking and therefore, he is writing to the spiritual leaders represented by this uh, angelos or angel or malach in Hebrew. And this, uh, you might say, the spiritual leadership in this local assembly are responsible to oversee the spiritual condition of those that gather in their locality. In this case, is the locality in a city that is called Pergamos. In fact, the meaning of the word Pergamos is really simply a, a speak of a time where there was marriage between the church and the state. You might say the, the believers became so much mingled with the world around them and did not necessarily separate it unto the Lord not isolated, but separated unto the Lord, Yeshua the Messiah. And therefore there was a, you might say, an intermarriage between the local church and as well the, the world. And in a sense, it represents the age where the church became, you might say, married to the state. And Christendom or Christianity became the religion of the state. And so we read in verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamos or Pergamum, present day Turkey today, he says, right. In other words, you notice that the Lord Jesus gave to the apostle Yohanan John to write this letter. So he's almost dictating to Yohanan to write. And here's what he said. In verse 12b, he says, These things says he which has a sharp sword with two edges. And so in verse 12b, we see that Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, presenting himself before the local assembly at Pergamos as the one that has the sharp sword with two edges. Again, to remind you, these descriptions of the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, are taken from the vision that John saw when he was on the island of Patmos in chapter 1, and he saw the glorified Christ, Christos, Mashiach in Hebrew, anointed one. He saw him there, and if you notice in verse 16, he, he said that he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. In other words, John saw the glorified Messiah on that island of Patmos in his vision, the one that had a sword, two-edged sword, coming out of his mouth. It really represents the Lord Jesus as the judge. You know, Yeshua is the judge of all the earth. In chapter 19, at his second coming, he is coming. When he's going to come, he's going to come with a sword. And he's going to judge the world in righteousness. But here, he's 
described as he's going to judge among the assemblies to see how God's people, how his people and those who claim to be part of his people, how do they behave? How do they live their lives? And oh, how he must, we must say many times that we who belong to the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, fail. In every generation, we could see God's people fail and the Lord judge his own people. Judgment began at the house of God. Peter said this in 1 Peter chapter 4 when he wrote to early Hebrew believers in the time that he was here upon the face of this earth. And so in verse 13 of our uh, 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 Revelation 2, verse uh, 13, he continued to say uh, to the uh, local assembly in Pergamos, and he gave them certain things that he's approved of. What we read in verse 13, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. You notice how beautiful Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, commending the local assembly, first of all, before he is going to say certain things that he is not approved of, he is, first of all, show that which he was approved of. And it is a beautiful thing to do because you see how the Lord is so gracious. He looks at us in our own life, in our own localities, among the worldwide assembly of the living God, the true believers, and even those who profess as if they are part of the people of God. He observes. He's the one that is walking in the, in the midst of the seven uh, candlesticks or seven lampstands, and he's observing to see the behavior of God's people. Often to our own shame, we can uh, uh, see how failing we have failed so much. God's people fail, whether it is historically in the history of Israel or whether it is in the church age. God's people fail, but the Lord always commending that which he can show approval of. And so in verse 13, we read, he said, I know your works. Apparently, some of the uh, uh, activities that they've done was pleasing to the Lord. Uh, you remember that we are, we are his workmanship. The Hebrew word ma'asim, works, is something that we do for God, but we do it out of the fact that we were forgiven, and we do it because we are forgiven. So I know your works, but he also says, notice then in verse 13, I know, he says, where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is. In other words, Satan's seat, well, Pergamos was known to be as the place where Satan worship was. In fact, my dear friend, the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, knew that the assembly was located in a city where Satan worship was active. In fact, we understand that uh, at the time in Pergamos, uh, Pergamos had the first temple dedicated to the Roman Caesar. And Pergamos was really regarded as a city where there was, uh, uh, there was given over to cult all sort of cults and pagan worship, Satan worship. So it was not an easy place to dwell. And so these uh, 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 local assembly, again, the true assembly was all those who truly belong to the Lord Jesus, the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, but there was always professors in the midst of God's people. And they dwelled in a city, in a locality where there was so much idolatry and worship of idols. And the Caesar began, you might say, there was a temple there that was first dedicated to the Roman Caesar sometime at 29 BC. Even be, before the assembly was formed, there was already Roman worship in this city that is called Pergamos. And so the Lord, he knew where these, this assembly was. He knew where this testimony was located. 
It's not easy to be in a, to follow the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, in a place where there are others who worship idols, who worship the Caesar, who worship uh, who have cultish kind of activities. It's not easy, and therefore he is commending them. He says, "I know your works, and I know where you dwell." But also, beloved friend, notice that in verse 13, Yeshua continued to say, You hold this fast my name, and you have not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr or faithful witness, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Apparently, there was this man by the name uh, of uh, Antipas, who became a martyr. He died for the faith. He died because he believed that Yeshua, Jesus, is the Christ, the anointed, the Mashiach, the Messiah. And he uh, understood that salvation is based on, a, on, on, the, on believing in the person and the, the work of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. Notice he said, you, have, you hold forth to my, to my name. What is in the name? Matthew 1, verse 21, you should call his name Yeshua, Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Salvation is his name. If you shall confess the name of Jesus, Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you shall be saved. And thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus as Lord. And believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The apostle Shaul Paul says in Romans chapter 10, There is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And the name, my dear friend, is Yeshua. In Greek, taken from the Hebrew Jesus or Jesus. But the word Yeshua simply means salvation. Yeshua, Jehovah the Savior. And there is no other name whereby one can be saved. And therefore they held his name, and they also did not deny the faith, my faith. The faith which was once and for all was delivered unto the saints. The faith of our Lord Jesus the Messiah. This is amazing. Without faith, it is not possible to please him. It's not possible to please, to please God. Because faith in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, provides salvation for the believer. And I trust that you have recognized that you are a sinner, like I am a sinner and all have sinned, and to believe in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, and that faith, trust in his work when he died and paid for our sins on that shameful Roman cross. So now, Antipas, this martyr, he died, he was slain as a testimony where in Pergamos, where Satan dwelleth, he stood for the name of the Lord Jesus the Messiah. Well, that was a commendation. And thank God that he commending the believers at Pergamos. But now in verses 14 and 15, here he is disapproved of certain things, a few things that were there in this locality. Two specific, specific things we see here in verses 14 and 15. First of all, in verse 14, notice that, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold, notice that, the doctrine of Bilam, in Hebrew, Limud Bilam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. You see, my dear friend, it is amazing how Yeshua is linking Israel's history and how Israel were, uh, you might say, influenced by godless, false prophet. And how dangerous it is for believers today of the assembly of the ecclesia to be also influenced by godless teaching. In uh, Numbers chapter uh, 25, in fact, chapter 22, we read, and I just want to read you these, uh, these verses. Numbers chapter 22, uh, and we read there about the call 
of Bilam to come to curse uh, the people of Israel. It says in verse 15, And Balak sent again princes more and more honorable than they. He sent again and again. And they came to Bilam and said unto him, Thus says Balak the son of Tzipor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me, I, for I will promote thee unto a very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come, therefore, and I pray thee, and curse me these people. These people are the people of Israel, God's chosen people, who just came out of the land of Egypt. And they were on the way to the promised land of Canaan. And sure enough, that false prophet, Bilam, uh, came to curse, but God did not allow him to curse Israel. So you know what he did? He paraded before the children of Israel, the, uh, the, the daughters of Moab, according to chapter 25. And Israel abode in Shittim, verse 1, and the people began to commit hudam before the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their God. And the people did eat and bowed down to their God. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. This is Numbers chapter 25, the first three verses. Well, it's the same way that such as Bilam were among the people of the assembly in Pergamos. It says here in verse 14, you have them that hold the doctrine, the teaching of Bilam. Bilam taught God's people to turn away from that which is true. That he put a stumbling block in order to call Israel to sacrifice unto idols and to commit fornication. And this is exactly what happened in the assembly in Pergamos. There were those that held the doctrine of Bilam. In fact, in chapter 2 and verse 6, the, we read of the fact that there are others in the Ephesus uh, church that also have been warned in uh, uh, Revelation chapter 2. It says there, you hate us the deeds. Uh, there also it says the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which is the next thing that the Lord is hating. But you notice that the teaching of Bilam, and secondly, in the um, uh, next verse, and you have them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. In other words, the teachings and the works and the action of the Nicolaitans was also existing there in the church of Pergamos. You notice that, as I mentioned in chapter 2, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, the Ephesians hated. The, uh, the local church at Ephesus hated the deeds. But by the time we get to Pergamos, we find out that now in Pergamos, they embraced not only the deeds, but actually the doctrine and the teaching. Notice that the doctrine of Bilam in verse 14, and the doctrine of the Nicolaitan or the Nicolaitans. By the way, the word Nicolaitans in verse 15, which we have already uh, spoke of, is really that uh, the fact that there was already there, there was an introducing the laity and clergy system that became to be, you might say, a separation between the ordinary believer and a certain clergy that is elevating himself above the ordinary believers in Jesus, in Yeshua, the Messiah. In fact, that uh, word, uh, the, the Nicolaitans, means simply the conquering of the people. In other words, there is an elite group of people that they assume themselves to be above the ordinary believer, and the priesthood of all believers have been set aside. To remind you, that Peter, in his epistle, in 1 Peter chapter 2, 
have taught the believers that all believers are both holy priesthood and royal priesthood. Every one of us who is a believer in Yeshua the Messiah is a priest, and we are called to function as a priest. We are holy priests. We are going into the presence of the Lord on behalf of God's people. And we are royal priests. We are going out of the presence of the Lord towards God's people and presenting Him before the people of God. So the Lord Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah, is disapproved in verses 14 and 15 of Revelation chapter 2 because they had there the doctrine of Bilam and they had there those that have taught and held to the doctrine of the a clergy laity, the conquerors of the people, the Nicolaitans. Well, now listen to what he uh, brings us into an exhortation. In verse 16, Yeshua the Messiah said to the people in that locality in Pergamos, he says to them, in verse 16, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Notice he said, be careful, repent, turn around, because I'm going to come, and I'm going to judge, I'm going to fight against them. These are those people who hold the doctrine of Bilam, those people who are holding the, 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 the teaching and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, the Nicolaitans. They are the clergy laity, and those who teach false teaching and, 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 and seek God's people to be, you might say, uh, being influenced by false doctrine, by false practices, uh, corrupting of the word of God. He says, you better repent or else I will come in judgment. And you see, he's the one, according to verse 16, that has that sword in his mouth represent judgment again to remind you that first peter chapter 4 and verse 17 says judgment must begin at the house of god judgment must begin at the house of god god is disciplining his own people in order to help them to grow spiritually and that's why he's asking the church of the pergamos locality to repent and finally, he's giving that a, a wonderful, assuring promises of blessing to the overcomer. Notice that, verse 17, he that hath an ear, do you have an ear? Okay, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches, to all the assemblies, not only to the Pergamos assembly, but what he says to Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos, and the rest of the four churches that will come later. He that has an ear, let him listen. Let him hear what the Spirit saying unto all the assemblies. And then he says, to him that overcometh. I remind you, beloved friend, we are all, all believers are overcomers positionally. But not all believers are overcomers practically. This is the need to overcome practically the condition that existed in this locality. And if we do so, there is a promise of blessing. Listen to this. Three things the Lord Yeshua is promising to the local assembly in Pergamos. Number one, he will give the overcomer the hidden manna. Number two, he will give the overcomer the white stone. And number three, he will give the overcomer a new name. And you notice that Hidden manna, the word man in Hebrew has to do with the bread that came down from heaven. Yeshua in John 6 called himself the bread from heaven. In other words, the overcomer will enjoy this special food and fellowship with the person of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. Secondly, he is saying here that he will give the overcomer a white stone. And the white stone represents an approval and acceptance. The Lord will accept His own who overcome the condition. He knows our need. He knows that we need grace to overcome various situations and various problems and various failure in our lives. But He promised that He will provide that approval. That white stone represents an approval in contrast to a black 
a stone. The white stone is acquittal. So when you stand before the judge and he says, no, you are acquitted, you are not condemned. And that's what the Lord promised to those who are overcome. And finally, he's promised the overcomer a new name. A new name simply represents a, a special relationship that the Lord will provide to those who have a, a turn to him and live for him. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. You remember he changed the name of Avram to Avraham? You remember he changed the name of Sarai to Sarah? You remember he changed the name from to ya- of Yaakov to Yisrael? Well, anyone who will be overcoming, he will give him a new name, which representing a mission, a service for the Lord, Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah, to live for him and to be a testimony for him in this world until he will come to take us to be with him in glory. Well, what do we learn? We learn from this Pergamos assembly that it is so important not to be married to the world, to where Satan is. And you notice that we have learned from these passages, especially with the disapproval of the Lord in verses 14 and 15, that they were already allowing things that were contrary to the Lord to enter into the assembly, into the church. They had the doctrine of Bilam, and they have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Clergy and laity, mixture with the world and its system. And that's what the Lord was disapproved with. And we learn when it's come to the chronological, historical age, in church age, this Pergamos assembly represents the age of the Constantine, who have, you might say, made the Christianity the religion of the state. And it represents the age between about 313 till about 600 AD, where the church became married with the state, and Christianity became the religion of the church, the religion of the, uh, you might say, of the world, of the state. And therefore, how much, beloved friend, one need the grace of God to stay close to the Lord Jesus and to learn the lesson from the uh, letter that was written by the Lord Jesus to the believers, to the assembly in Pergamos. Well, may God bless his word, and until the next session, I will say for now, Shalom, Shalom. Shalom.